All right, let's begin. Welcome to CS 2050. Topic of today is on asymptotics on big O notation. So um, you guys may have seen big O in some other setting of the analysis of algorithms. You've seen like big O of n squared or something like this. This is more formal about uh, foundations of what that actually means. What's the point of big O? So uh, consider two computers. We have computer A and we have computer B. OK. Suppose computer A can do one thing at a time. Computer B, maybe it has two cores. It can do two things at a time. If you give them the same task to do, to do n things, computer 1 will have to do each thing one at a time, and it'll take computer A n steps for it to do n things. But computer 2 is more powerful. It can do two things at a time. So if it can do two things at a, at a time, how long does it take it to do n things? n over 2. So computer 2 is twice as fast as computer 1. Um, and you may have good experience with you know, computers, of course, being faster than each other. But we want to study not computers. We want to study algorithms. So we don't want to study how fast computers are. We want to study how fast algorithms are. So we want somehow to measure the efficiency of an algorithm independent of the computer that it's run on. Given an algorithm, you run it on different computers, you can't say, well, my computer's faster, so my algorithm's faster. That's not true. When we want some way to measure how fast an algorithm is and compare algorithms to each other without uh, comparing necessarily the computers that they're run on. You can't literally just start in a stopwatch and say, oh, this one finished faster, so it's a better algorithm. You may just have a supercomputer involved. You, know? um, you guys have also probably heard of something called Moore's Law. You guys heard of Moore's Law in some setting? Basically, Moore's Law said, and this is Moore was like the CEO of Intel in the early years, 1950s and 60s or, or something like this. He said, basically, the computation power of a, of a computer doubled every six months. Excuse me, every 18 months. So the, 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 the fastest computer would double every 18 months. Sort of recently, we've seen the end of Moore's Law. Like, there's not, people, computer chips are only getting, not, like, instead of 200% gains, they're getting, like, 25% gains in specific tasks through lots of optimization. The moral of Moore's law is like you built a computer chip, it's got a bunch of gates in it, it's got a bunch of wires and stuff going on, right? You get the silicon and you get the you trick the sand into doing some thinking for you. But what at the time what basically what we do, the way we build computers nowadays is we try and pack as much tiny wires into the smallest density that we can. That is the way we make computers faster. But this is not the way we always made computers faster. Sometimes people come in and try to be creative. And they say, well, you know, I need to build a computer. Let's do something like this. Let's do something this way. And there was a, I think it was IBM, they built this strange 80 core machine in the 1960s. Uh, they figured out a way to get 80 computers into one computer or something, some, some kind of giant mainframe. But it took them such a long time to research and develop this new weird machine, this new weird computer, that by the time they f brought the product to market, Intel had figured out how to shrink wires even smaller. And uh, this, what beat a computer that was state of the art 18 months ago doesn't beat a computer today. Moore's Law basically says, trying to come up with creative solutions new architectures, new paradigms in computing is, takes too long. It's much faster to take the stupid way and shrink it really small. It's much faster to make a normal computer and then try and pack in the wires. That's going to beat you every single time of coming up with something new, something strange. You know? So it, Moore's Law basically says the computers, uh, the power of the computers, although they're relatively simple compared to other strange devices that existed at the time, 
the computer speed is dub was doubling basically every every eighteen months. You bought a computer in nineteen ninety five; it was out of date by nineteen ninety eight. You know, you couldn't it was it couldn't run modern software. Today, this is less true, but it's still it's still somewhat true. You know, I use as my daily driver so on. I use as my daily driver a, a Chromebook from twenty thirteen, and it does it work? Yes, it is less powerful and it has less RAM than my than my phone does now but it still works you know but just the scale of things you can now play i saw you could play like uh an xbox 360 game on the new samsung phone and it's like that was insane because back in the day you would have to have this big powerful box to lug around so computers are getting faster even maybe they don't uh seem this way and early on people were thinking of, we need a way to compare algorithms but we don't want to compare the computers because you know the guy at ibm shouldn't maybe they'll Finish the, the algorithm will finish faster on their computer than ours, but it doesn't mean they have a better algorithm. We want to compare the algorithms. An algorithm, again, is a theoretical specification of telling the computer what to do. Uh, we want to compare the algorithms, but not compare the computers. The fact that a computer is faster, we don't want to take into effect. So what we do is we measure the runtime of an algorithm as a function of its input size. So a function in big O usually will be defined from uh, the naturals having a codomain of the naturals to perhaps of some positive real number. And functions may have all kinds of weird and, and interesting properties, but we want to isolate uh, the growth rate of the functions, the asymptotics, and study only those. So what we do is we study what's called the big O of a function. So we say, um, uh, f of n is O of g of n if there exists if there exists uh, n not c uh, positive real numbers and these are called their witnesses <coughs> uh, such that for all n greater uh, than or greater than or equal to n naught, uh, that uh, f of n is less than or equal to c g of n. Now, the, sometimes you may see f of n is equal to o of g of n. This isn't technically correct. It's not the same equal sign, but it's a, no, it's a very common notation. Uh, f, o of f of n is really a function, is a set of all possible functions that have uh, the property of the, of the functions being O of that. But that's not really, it's too kind of cumbersome. Rather, you should think of big O as a property of a function. f of n is O of g of n, if it, if it has a certain property. The way to think about this is really is that it's upper bounded by g of n up to asymptotics. And that's very important. This, there's two parts here, this witnesses, n greater than n naught, and then this multiplication by some constant c. What this does for us is basically says, ignoring multiplicative constants, and after a certain time period, um, will one outgrow the other. So it, it, it's concerning ourselves with inputs at the very large scale. So consider I plot two functions. Consider I plot like uh, 0 0.001 n squared, and then I plot n plus 100, or something like this, OK? Those are two functions. Which one of them is bigger? Well, functions, it depends what value you compare it at. But if you take it, let's plot n plus 100 first, OK? n plus 100. Uh, if you, what you're going to do is you're going to go up the y-axis, you're going to find 100, and then you're going to draw the function f of n equals n, right? Like that. And then uh, 0.001n squared is going to be n squared, but it's going to be like flattened, right? So it's going to look like this. Maybe I'll, let me just squeeze the diagram down so it looks a little clearer, right? So suppose I shrink and play with the x side to get that plot to fit on the board. Now, notice that uh, this is... Uh, n plus 100, and this is 0.001 n squared, okay? It doesn't really matter the fact that we added a lot to n to make it really big, and we multiplied n squared by a lot to make it, by a little amount to make it really, really, really small. Simply by the fact of, you take the limit of both of these, there will exist a point 
and some point in the future that the smaller function will overtake the bigger function. This is what we want to have as n naught. n naught, for n greater than n naught, what we mean is at some point in the future, the function is bigger. Right? It's in some sense a definition of, of the limit. It doesn't matter for small sizes, is one function bigger than the other. Big O is only about the asymptotics. Right? Observe from this immediately, because of the multiplicative constants, we get that uh, n plus 100 is O of n. Do you agree with that? n plus 100 is the same as O of n. Uh, n is O of n, but so is n over 2 is O of n. Same with, I don't know, 100n is O of n, right? In practice, you know, an engineer would love to have a speed up of its algorithm by 2. You know, sometimes you see, I sped this algorithm up by 70, the implementation of this algorithm by 73%. We can so satisfy all our customers really quickly. But 73% is just a constant, you know? I use a 10-year-old Chromebook, and it's 25 times slower than my phone, but 25 is still a constant. Any algorithm that I could run on your phone can still be run on my computer with just a constant loss in uh, efficiency. This constant here, C of n, basically is historically really for Moore's law. The fact that the computer is 10 times faster shouldn't have an effect on the algorithm. 10 times is still just a constant. So uh, if you have, for example, so perhaps some strange function f, something like this, and then you have some function g. So this is, let's say this is f of n, this is g of n. Then you can multiply that g of n by c, and if you can upper bound it like that, so we'll say that's c g of n. If you can upper bound it by c g of n, then f of n is big O of g of n, right? Question so far? You guys have done big O in some other setting, right? In some other class a little bit? Tiny amount, maybe, right? You've seen like, oh, I have a double for loop. It's O of n squared, something, something trivial like this, right? There are a few common classes that most run t the algorithms of runtimes fall into. Uh, we have O of 1. An algorithm can run in O of 1 time. We have O of log, log n. It's a log of log of n. I'm going to sort these by the asymptotic growth rates. You may perhaps know from pre-calculus growth rates. Uh, we have O of log of n. We have O of n. Uh, o of n log n. O of n squared. Uh, then we also have O of n cubed. Uh, O of n to the fourth, and so on. Then we have O of n. Yes. There's a couple others in there. For simplicity, we'll say 2 to the n. We have O of, what's another one that's bigger than 2 to the n? Does anyone know? 3 to the n. 3 to the n? Yeah. Uh, n factorial? n to the n? Those are like. If you have algorithms at this runtime, that's, I mean, that's not good. That's really bad, right? Um, what is a good algorithm? It's subjective. I mean, in cryptography, I'd be happy for some problems having a polynomial time algorithm at all. That's good enough for me. Uh, in practice, though, like anything less than n squared is considered good. n squared is considered like, well, fine, I, I guess. You know, anything above that is considered bad. Um, by the way, the input size for an algorithm is we say is a function of n. Like you're sorting or something, you have n elements, right? If you, you have numbers, you have n bits. Uh, if you have algorithms that run in O of 1, log log n, or log n time, those are, no, those are run times that are less than n, right? So what that means is the algorithm is so fast, it doesn't even have time to read the input. Whatever problem it's solving, it can read by just checking a little bit of the input. It doesn't even have time to read the entire thing that it's given, right? What's an algorithm that you know runs in less than n time? Merge sort. Merge sort actually runs in n log n time. Quicksort. Quicksort, I think, also runs in n log n time. Any sorting algorithm, you don't know this yet, but must take n log n steps. Yes? Binary search. Binary search takes log n time. The efficiency of binary search is simply by the fact that it doesn't have to read the entire input. 
Imagine one program, binary search is on the input, a second program loops over the input. Binary search will finish before the program can even finish reading the input. The efficiency of binary search comes from the fact that you're promised that the input is sorted. So you get to like, jump through it. Because of that, that's how binary search is so efficient, right? These are common classes of uh, um, functions. We need to, like, when you have the runtime of an algorithm, you need to, like, found it on proof. And you need to prove the runtime is a certain thing. And that's the way you can, only, only way you can determine efficiency. For example, in the proof of merge sort, you'll say, or any sorting algorithm, you'll end up with saying it takes this number of steps, right? Um, but is that really big or really small? You can't really look at the function and just say, well, it's, it's this or that. N factorial, really, really, really big. Okay, log really, really, really small. In fact, log is the inverse of an exponential, right? So as fast as exponential is, log is as slow. People underestimate over. People think log is like medium, but actually, it's very, very fast, right? Um, log is so slow. In fact, two to the uh, two to the hundred is two to the one hundred is more than the number of atoms in the universe. Okay, two to the one hundred is such an infathomably large number. Uh, but log of 2 to the 100 is just what? Just 100, right? By the way, I'm not writing the subscript. When we write log, we usually mean log base 2. We'll prove later there's a reason we're not writing the subscript. It doesn't really matter. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, n factorial, really big. Very quick for it to get past 2 to the 100 for very small values, like 40, I think. Uh, what is log of n factorial? Is that big or small? What do we think? If I just had to poll the audience for a guess. Small? You think the log makes it smaller than, than n factorial grows big? That is interesting intuition. If you had to place it on the, on the scale here, where would you put it? Just curious. After n cubed. After n cubed, so it's big. So you think it's greater than n cubed. OK, well, let's binary search over all the answers. Do you think it's? Let's take the halfway point. Do you think it's less than 3 to the n? Yes. OK, do you think it's more than n over 4? OK, so you think it's probably between n over 4. It's somewhere between a, the, a large polynomial and a small exponential. You have a different answer. What do you think it is? Or you're just nodding your head. Uh, I was thinking maybe, so n factorial plans, is, I'm pretty sure factorials have like a greater growth rate than uh, like, Two to the end. Correct. So it'd probably be like, I mean, definitely less than n factorial, obviously. But I think over like, the, like a very very large data set, it would eventually outgrow the log. Yes. So you you're saying log of n uh, factorial is asymptotically greater, and I'm just going to put a question mark here because we're gonna, we're formalizing a asymptotic. Right, right now, let's just go by vibes. Log of n factorial should outgrow log of two to the n. Is what you're saying? Yeah. And log of 2 to the n is just n. So we know that log of n factorial ought to be greater than n. But by how much? We won't prove this in this class. But I'll, I'll tell you that basically n, uh, by Sterling's approximation, n factorial is almost n to the n. Whatever terms that are there actually vanish when you take the log. So log of n factorial is actually O of n log n. That is unexpected to your intuition, I think. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because it's something like that requires proof. You, would, you can't just say big, small, and then hope for an answer. It, uh, it, that, I think, is kind of surprising. This is part of the, ne the necessity of proving uh, not only that merge sort or quick sort or any of these algorithms take n log n steps, but then they actually can't do any better. So this is, this is one of the ways you would prove that. Um, that's why proof is necessary. Because sometimes you can look at it and say, wow, that's obviously that. But sometimes you can't, right? So let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about proofs. Let's talk about how you prove a function to be a big O of something, right? So suppose we want to prove uh, n log n is O of n squared. Now, when you say some function is big O of some other function, what you mean is that function is an upper bound. 
It doesn't necessarily mean it's like a nice tight upper bound. It just means that it is an upper bound, right? We want to prove that n log n is strictly, uh, not strictly, but definitely less than n squared, right? Um, how would we do this is you simply have to find, according to the big O definition, you simply find witnesses uh, n naught and c such that uh, for all n greater than n naught, that n log n is uh, less than or equal to c n squared. So let's choose some n's. Let's choose n naught to be some number, and let's choose c to be some number. Well, I don't know. Let's choose n naught to be 3, and let's choose c to be 2. Sometimes it doesn't really matter what numbers you pick. Sometimes it does. You want to choose relatively small numbers close to the points. Recall, like, if you have something more controversial like this, uh, you may want to choose a large enough n naught so that it's past whatever inflection point they have. If you have two monotonic functions, by the way, they'll intersect in exactly one point. But you're not always given if they're not parallel. You, you, you may not be given, uh, or I guess if one also upper bounds the other, but you may not be given a monotonic function. You may have some function like this, OK? And you may have to upper bound it by a constant times something, something that normally would intersect it. Um, so finding c and n naught can be difficult sometimes. This one will just, as a warm-up, we'll, we'll, we'll say it's easier. Uh, uh, for all n greater than uh, n naught, we have n log n is less than or equal to 2n squared, right? Well, what happens if we divide both sides by uh, n? If n is greater than n naught, n is greater than or equal to 3. The reason I chose n equals 3 is because I know some weird things happen around log equals 1. So I just chose a value slightly bigger than that because, we, again, we care about the limits of things. It doesn't really matter. I could have, in fact, chosen uh, n naught to be 100 or something, and I would have been fine. Uh, if I divide both sides by n, I get that log n is less than or equal to 2n, which is true. So we see that n naught and c are witnesses. Uh, for this, and that n log n is uh, O of n squared, right? This is how you would prove, if asked to prove uh, one function is big O of the other. It's almost uh, too boring to be interesting. You would simply say we proceed directly. Uh, I choose my witnesses n naught and c, and then I proceed, right? What if we wanted, is n, is n log n uh, is, is it O of n? Poll for the audience. No. Intu we'll prove it's not, but intuitively, why not? Is this the product of two positive numbers? Yeah. That is always going to be greater by some log n number than that one is, right? Um, here's how you prove something is not a big O of something else. Assume to the contrary. That uh, n log n is O of n. Um, normally in a proof, you always sort of uh, deduce yourself down to the most basic definitions. If n log n is O of n, what is the next step? Find our witnesses. Find our witnesses? Well, what you should do instead is delegate exactly and only to the definition of what big O means. That means then, uh, then uh, there exists witnesses n not c, which are elements of the positive reals, uh, such that for all n greater than n not, uh, n log of n is uh, less than or equal to c n. Okay. Now, 
we may suppose that n naught is positive, just so we don't have to divide by zero. Most ru the runtimes of big O is a much more general theory than uh, the runtimes of functions. Notice we also only define it over functions where the domain is the naturals, because that's the size of the inputs. Computer inputs are like natural numbers in terms of size. They're never you're never you're never going to be asked to sort square root of two elements or something weird. Okay. Um, but yet the functions will map to a real number because log may necessarily be real, right? Uh, so if we suppose that n is positive here, as it ought to be, then, then this implies we can divide both sides by n. So we get that log n is less than or equal to some witness c. What's our contradiction here? It may not be obvious to you, but I want to see if we observe it. There's a contradiction already on the board. It's like lotter is can can infinitely increase, so there should be no c that log n. C is a constant. C is bounded. C does not grow. Log n is always growing. It grows slow, but it grows. Picturely, and again, like a picture is not a proof. That's log of n. It's always monotonically. Log of n is monotonically increasing. C is constant. For any such c, there exists an n such that log of n will outgrow that c. Contradiction. Left hand side is increasing, in fact, increasing monotonically, but we can just say increasing. But right hand side is bounded. Log of n is not a bounded function. That's our contradiction. Therefore, we know that uh, n log n is not O of n. So n log n grows above. O of n, but also grows below n squared. So if we were to draw a picture, we have O of n, right? We have n squared, and then maybe we have something like that. That's n log n, that's n, and that's n squared, right? It's its own thing. Now, the next question you may have is like, how much, uh, OK, adding a multiplying by a log is, um, really, it definitely gives asymptotic power, right? We're concerned with asymptotics of things. How many logs do you have to give to give asymptotic power? Like a lot of power. Let's say you had a lot of logs. Um, how many logs is enough, right? How many logs could you have to surpass n squared? It's as if, as if, if, imagine n times 100 logs, is that above n squared or not? So I guess the question I'm asking is, uh, what about n times log of n to the 100? Uh, is this O of, uh, of n squared? We don't think so? Do we think so? It's a lot of logs. What about 1,000 logs? Don't think so? Well, let's ask a different question. What about log of n to the 100 is O of n? Right? Uh, it turns out no matter how many logs that you have, log of n times log of n times log of n times log of n, turns out a lot of those logs doesn't matter how many you have, a billion of them, it's still asymptotically less than uh, O of n. Now, it may, for small values, uh, succeed. But for large values, OK, for example, this side, n equals 2. You have 2 to the 100 on the left-hand side. You have 2 on the right-hand side. So 2 to the 100 is certainly bigger than 2. 
putting this power up here just pushes past, just pushes into the future the inflection point. But the inflection point must always still occur because you're only multiplying something by constantly many times. We can prove this O of n, excuse me, log of n to the 100 is O of n. We'll prove this by finding witnesses. Okay? We proceed directly. Consider uh, n not to be, what do I have? Let's consider 4. And let's consider c to be, give me a, give me a value of c. 10. 10? That's not big enough. You can choose any constant you want. I'm going to choose a really big one. Let's choose 2 to the 100 more than the atoms in the universe. There's only like 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. Right? I've chosen these values by working it out beforehand so the proof is correct, right? Cool part about choosing C is you get to choose really large constants. If the function truly is asymptotically greater, it shouldn't matter what constant you choose. In practice, you don't want to always start with 2 to the 100. But for this specific example, I know it'll work, right? Then consider uh, for all n uh, greater than n, uh, greater than equal to n naught, uh, log of n to the 100 uh, is less than or equal to Cn, right? If we were to plug in uh, n naught into this equation, to the 100 n, to the 100 is very, very big. But in some sense, it's also very, very small because it's just a constant. You, for 2 to the 100, any function grows above it. Eventually, uh, absurdly, in an absurd, absurdly long time, the heat death of the universe will occur before you can ever count that high, getting, cl getting or close to that. But it's, in theory, it's just a constant. So it's, of course, it's no different than 1, right? O of 2 to the 100 is just the same thing as O of 1. Those are both constants. Same thing. Um, now, if we plug in n is n not here on the left hand side, if we consider that n is greater than that, what are we going to get here? What is log of four? Let's suppose it's log base two. In fact, okay, two. So we're going to get two to the one hundred is less than or equal to two to the one hundred squared. Two to the one hundred n, right? I chose c to be two to the hundred for this reason. Certainly, it's true. So in fact, no matter how many logs you have, uh, o, to the, o to the n is bigger than that, right, uh, for large enough n. In fact, what, when do these functions equal if you were to plot their inflection points? You have n, and then you have I, the plot of log of n to the 100 looks kind of weird. It looks like this. Like it's flat for a little bit, and then around uh, n is equal to 11, approximately, maybe like 10.5. Is there the actual inflection point? It doesn't matter. I can choose a constant uh, c large enough that I can modify the function at some point in the future after n is greater than n naught, which is 4, that we are upper bound at the function, right? Let's do a few more with logs, because logs are always interesting for people. Um, what do we think about log of kn? What do you think log of kn, where k is a constant, where k is some, let's even say it's a natural number instead of a real number, but it's true for real numbers. If k of n, what do we think about log of kn, asymptotically? Is O of log of n. Why? What are the log rules? Let's prove it. Uh, notice that log of uh, kn is equal to log of what? Yeah, log of k plus log of n. Log of k is just what a con is a constant. It's just like plus two or whatever. No matter what that constant is, um, if k is two to the one hundred, then log of two to the one hundred is just one hundred, right? So it's not even a big constant. So uh, choose uh, some n not way bigger than this. This is not a multiplicative thing; it's an additive thing. Choose some n not way in the future. Uh, and c to be, let's say, 2, right? So for what n naught should we choose such that n log of n, uh, such that 
log of n plus log of k is, uh, we want this to be less than or equal to 2 log of n, right? What uh, n naught should we choose for that to be true? Because the log of k shifts everything, all right? Here's our log of k. This is log of kn. This is, well, that's log of kn. This is log of n, right? Something like this. This will outgrow this one. This is log of kn, and this is log of n. If you just set this one above it, it'll outgrow it eventually. This additive, this additive term doesn't do anything. They end up having the same asymptotics. Um, maybe I should draw it like this. K, Let's see. Excuse, you said K. Yeah. So, I didn't actually work this one out. Let's try it. Uh, consider uh, if we plug K in here, we're going to get log of K. We're going to get two log K, which must be less than n naught, which is K. So K actually works. Perfect. So choose K, n naught greater than whatever K is. Maybe even set it to k plus 1 if you, don't, you want to avoid that little error. You don't need to choose the actual literal inflection point. You want to choose something in the future, right? Again, if you have two functions like this, let's say n squared and a large additive linear function like this, finding exactly that inflection point may be computationally difficult. You have to set the two functions equal to each other, squared both sides, do a bunch of weird things. Instead, just say, well, it's probably between 2 and 3 or whatever. I'm just going to say n equals 4, whatever, right? At some point in the future. This n for all n greater than n not business is really about taking the limit of a function, right? So the, the knowledge you may have about limits will come in really handy here. Um, let me do two more log questions. And then we'll do another big O proof. OK, so we said log kn is O of log n. What about log of n to the k for k some constant? What is, do we expect this to be? Log n again, why? Yeah, log rule, same thing. Uh, log of n to the k is equal to, now do you guys know why you bring the k in front? This is equal to k log n. Do you remember why? You have the rule log of a, b is equal to log of a. What's log of b, right? That's a rule you have. So log of n to the k is equal to log of n times n times n times n k times. So this is equal then to log of n plus log of n plus, plus log of n. This occurs k times. Man. This is a little unnecessary on my part, but then that is equal to uh, the sum of i equals 1 to k of log of n, which is just equal to k log n, right? That's why, that, that's why you do this, the cloggle rule. You bring down the c for that reason. Um, so uh, log of So log of n to the k is then equal to k log of n, right? So we want to prove that it's O of log of n. What's our witnesses? C could be k. C could be k. I'm going to even say k plus 1, so it's bigger. It's true, k would work perfectly. But sometimes you just want to be lazy and not. For what value? It doesn't really matter. Let's say like 3. I like 3. Um, so we know that uh, k log of n uh, is less than or equal to 3 log of n. Excuse me. 
k plus 1 log of n for n greater than uh, equal to n naught. True. OK, good. So a polynomial, a log of a polynomial is no better than a linear term. It doesn't matter how big the internals are if it's a polynomial. n to the 100, oh man, that's really bad. Log of n to the 100, that's just linear time. That n comes down, then you only get a constant speed up in the algorithm, right? Questions on this one? Yeah. Let's explain really quick what the big O means. The big O is the, we'll do some, we'll, we'll, go, we'll tie this back to like pre-calculus asymptotics in just a second. The big O means the asymptotics, like what is this function bounded above by? That is basically what we mean. What we mean is log of n to the k if you were to simplify it in some sense. At, as you take the limit, it is indistinguishable from log n. It's the same as you take the limit, though. So it hides, in some sense, multiplicative constants from us. So for example, like uh, f is always big O of f, but then like 10f plus 1,000 doesn't change the function. It just, in some sense, like there's, there's a formal definition of big O, but there's also like a useful way to think about it. In some sense, you can think that it just gets rid of some of the stuff for us. And we just, it, it, it removes the gas, and we just get to look at the, the, the part that grows the fastest. We'll tie this back into um, an asymptotic definition you may know uh, in, in a second. But I want to do one more log rule. Does that answer your question for now? Um, more questions on this one? Let's do one more. Uh, there's a reason I've, I've not been writing the log base, and it's not because I'm lazy. I'm also lazy, but it's because I'm a computer scientist. And when we are computer science, we don't really care about the log a lot of times. Um, the reason for that is because asymptotically, all the logs are the same. Uh, do you guys remember the log? What is log k of n for some constant k? Do you guys remember the change of base formula? Suppose we want to change log k of n into log 2 of n. Do you remember the, the, the change of base formula? Yes. That's the change of base formula. So you go from base k to base 2. You simply uh, say log of k of n is equal to log 2 of n over log 2 of k. And then to get log 2 of n in terms of the other one, maybe you divide, you multiply both sides by something, you divide both sides by something, whatever, right? But what is log 2 of k? Constant. It's a constant. That's, that's the only difference between log 2 of n and log k of n is a constant. So we will prove that log k of n is O of log 2 of n. And there's a reason we don't write the log, the base. It's, um, it's always assumed to be log 2 when you have to use it. But log is like its own special thing independent of the base you write it in because asymptotically, the only difference between log 2 and log 3 is multiplication by a constant. Not even adding a term, just multiplication by a constant. So we prove this, right? Log k of n is equal to log 2 of n over log 2 of k. So we choose c to be something greater than 1 over log 2 of k. Uh, let's say plus 1, whatever, some, plus some small epsilon. And then we choose n naught to be, I don't know, 3. doesn't really matter. I like three. They're, they're, sometimes you can't always choose three because the function may dip down. Maybe not. It may be not a nice function, but for the ones we're doing so far, they're all going to be nice. Uh, then we know that uh, log k of n is less than or equal to one over log k, uh, k of two k of two plus one times log of n log two of n which is just equal to log k of n plus log 2 of n, right? And then this is certainly true uh, for, uh, for all n greater than n naught. Certainly that's true. Right. Questions on that one? Change of base formula, again, moral here, multiplication by a constant. It doesn't do anything to us. 
All right. Let me give you a few rules, uh, uh, some things that you can assume. So consider any polynomial. Consider f of n uh, is equal to, let's say, a to the k, uh, n to the k, plus that, 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 plus uh, a to the 1, n plus a0, right? So this is our polynomial. Uh, what is f of n? f of n is what? Asymptotically. n to the k. This corresponds to our definitions of limits. When you take the limit of a function, it's, it's, it's the same as taking the largest term. How would you prove this? C would be k, and then you would find some inf large enough inflection point n0. Um, for example, what is like uh, 10x to the 7 plus, I don't know, oh, excuse me, let's say like minus 1,000 x squared plus 1, something like this, 100 x squared, something weird, OK? The minus x squared. When you plot this, it's not going to look nice now. It's going to be like some, something funny is going to go on. But eventually, x to the 7 is going to outgrow whatever subtraction is going on here. This, in some sense, is inconsequential in the large the manner of things. This is huge, x to the 7. So this is going to be uh, O of x to the 7, right? That's what that function is. What about, uh, so this is something you may assume without proof. You can. Proof you can do, I think, in five seconds, but it's useful. Um, what about uh, f of n is a, is a ratio of polynomials? Suppose we have a to the k, n to the k, plus, plus a to the 1, n plus a0 over uh, a to the l. Excuse me, let's say, yeah, let's say, let's say b to the l, uh, n to the l plus plus b1, uh, n plus b0, something like this. What do we think this is big O of? You have a ratio of polynomials now. n to the k minus l. k minus l. Let's be a little more specific. What if n is 20 and k is 3? 17. Hmm? Or n to the 17. E, that would be n to the minus 17. K minus L could be negative. So in fact, it would add, that would be correct. But in terms of we want positive growth rates, so conventionally, I'm just going to say the same thing. Actually, I'll say something worse that's less clear, but perhaps more equitable. Um, F of n is O of n to the K minus L if a K is greater than or equal to L. And then we'll say F of n is O of 1 if k is less than L. Now, is O of negative 17 technically going to be a big O of that? But we don't want to upper bound a decreasing function. We are satisfied with doing a constant. Right? The function, if you, have, if you have L much larger than k, you may have something that looks like this. Right? Let's say it even tends to 0. Um, sure, you can upper bound that by another decreasing function, or you can upper bound that by a constant. Done. Right? So I'll write it this way conventionally. Question on this one. This is also something you may assume without proof. And this is something you may have seen from limits. You take the limit of this. Uh, in fact, it's the, it's the top dominating term divided by the bottom dominating term. So you get k minus l. Right? The rest of it ends up being inconsequential in the long run. Big O is basically a discrete version of the limits that you've learned in pre-calculus. Right. Any questions on this one? OK, uh, let's do two more quick uh, problems. Uh, but f1 uh, of n, suppose f1 of n is O of uh, g1 of n. And let, f, uh, uh, let uh, f2 of n uh, be O of g2 of n, right? 
uh, what do we think that, let's say f of n is equal to uh, f of f1 of n plus f2 of n. Okay, so it's just the sum of the two functions. And let's suppose that f of n is O of g of n. What is g of n? So you can, instead of delegating perhaps to the formal definition of big O, delegate to your intuition. f of n is a sum of two functions. What should be an upper bound of the sum of two functions in terms of the upper bounds of each of those functions? There are several answers to this question. Um, which one? Uh, Gn is uh, equal to which one is G one or G two? Yeah, exactly. We'll call it the max of G one. So at every point, let's say you have G one like this, and you have G two like this. You didn't write the subscript two. And you would write g of n to be this one. It's the max of both two. Another upper bound, which is not as nice, would be the sum. Right? Certainly f of n, f1 plus f2 is upper bounded by g1 plus g2. Right? But in fact, if f1 outgrows f2, then its upper bound will also be an upper bound of f2. So certainly, the max of the two upper bounds is going to be the upper bound of the sum. This is also a property you may use. Convince yourself that it's true. This is something I think is a good test of, do you understand big O? Do you understand how the things move around, the pieces move? Let's do the same thing. Um, suppose f of n is equal to f1 uh, of n times g, uh, f2 of n. Uh, and then f of n is O of g of n. Uh, g of n is what? Suppose still these two are true. f1 of n is O of g1 of n, and f2 of n is O of g2 of n. What is g in terms of f1, f2, g1, g2? Yeah, it's going to be the product. So when you sum functions, you, the big O of that is the, is the max. When you product functions, you have to take the product of their, of their upper bounds. That's what that says. Any further questions on big O? A witness proofs? Contradiction witness proofs? Anything in general? All right.